Section 1. Introduction. Last video, we used a purely counting-based trick to find an element inside an ideal J of relatively small norm. The ideal J formed a lattice inside our ring, and we picked a large square of elements inside the ring, and we argued this square has more elements than any fundamental cell of J. That means that it's so big relative to J that it must contain two elements that differ by an element of J. This is the pigeonhole principle, if you've heard of it. So we picked an element of J, and the size of that element of J was bounded by the size of the square. Minkowski's theorem is a refinement of this idea. Last video I talked about the norm of a sublattice, and I said that it could be thought of as a kind of area or volume, which is a kind of geometric concept. Or that it could be thought of as the number of points inside a fundamental cell, which is a combinatorial concept. One is measuring, the other is counting. Minkowski showed that if you're careful about it, you can often relate the two. Section 2. Lattices. Let's forget all about number theory for now and do some basic geometry. So far, we've only really dealt with one- and two-dimensional lattices, because that's all I can draw. But of course, we need to be able to deal with all possible lattices. Let's start off inside R to the n, an n-dimensional real vector space. And inside here, I want to consider a lattice, by which I mean an n-dimensional arrangement of points that looks like z to the n. I'll put it at the origin, and as always, I don't mind if its basis vectors are a bit skewed relative to the ambient space. And inside here, as before, I'll take a sublattice, also at the origin. Here are a couple of examples. In each case, I've shaded in a fundamental cell for the sublattice. Like before, I'm going to call the number of points in a fundamental cell the norm of the sublattice. Maybe after shifting it slightly so that I don't get ambiguous points on the boundary. This is kind of a crude measure of how much we've had to scale the area or volume of the original lattice to get the sublattice. Now suppose I'm sitting at the origin, and I blow a little bubble around me. There are rules to what this bubble is allowed to look like. It doesn't have to be spherical or circular, but it does have to be symmetric about the origin, and it has to stay convex. So these examples here aren't allowed, but these are. We'll ask the question, as I blow this bubble, how big does it have to be before we can ensure that it hits the point of my sublattice? In one dimension, I blow the bubble outwards to the left and right, symmetrically, and it can get to twice the size of my fundamental cell before it hits a lattice point. Okay, in two dimensions it's a bit trickier because you can have these strange long and thin bubbles, but it turns out that no matter what shape it has, no bubble can get any bigger in area than this rectangular one here, which covers four fundamental cells before it runs into a lattice point. Maybe you can visualize it in 3D too. A cuboid-shaped bubble could cover eight fundamental cells before it ran into a lattice point. Even if you try different shapes, you can't make the bubble any bigger as long as it stays symmetric and convex. This is Minkowski's theorem. In an n-dimensional lattice, if the volume of your bubble is more than 2 to the n times the volume of your fundamental cell, then the bubble must contain a lattice point other than the origin. This is a really simple but surprisingly powerful tool. Let's see how we might have used it last video. Section 3. A better bound for the ideal classes. Last video we showed that in the ring z adjoin root minus 5, every integral ideal j contains some element alpha such that the norm of alpha divided by the norm of j was at most 6. This meant that we only had to check ideals of norm up to 6 by the ideal rescaling lemma to tell us things about the ideal classes. But we could have done better with this bound. Our aim in this section is to improve it. Now that we're doing some geometry, let's be careful about our pictures. We've always drawn this intuitive additive picture on the left, but it's going to be useful for us to stretch it vertically by a factor of root 5 and consider it as sitting inside the complex plane. So the point a plus b root minus 5 now has real part a, an imaginary part 
b root 5. Okay, so the norm of an element a squared plus 5b squared is really just the square of its distance from the origin. And we have to be a little careful about what we mean by the norm of a sublattice j too. We said that the norm was the number of points inside a cell, or it was the area of the cell. Well, now the number of points hasn't changed, but the area has stretched by a factor of root 5. So I'm going to say that the norm is the number of points in a cell, and the area is root 5 times the norm of j over in this picture. Okay, so let's sit at the origin and blow a circular bubble. x squared plus y squared equals r squared for some radius r. As we've just discussed, all points on or inside this bubble have norm at most r squared. Now, Minkowski's theorem says that if we choose the radius so that the area of this circle, pi r squared, is four times the area of a fundamental cell, that's four times root five times the norm of j, then this bubble will contain a non-zero element, alpha, of j. But because alpha is inside this bubble, it has norm at most r squared. Putting these facts together and rearranging, that gives us that the norm of alpha divided by the norm of j is at most 4 root 5 over pi, which is about 2.85. But actually, it's not hard to see that the norm of alpha over the norm of j must be an integer. So it's actually bounded above by 2. This means that in order to work out the ideal classes of z adjoined root minus 5, we only had to look at ideals of norm at most 2. Here's an exercise to show you again how powerful this tool is. Repeat this calculation for the ring z adjoin 1 plus root minus 7 over 2. The norm function again will just be the square of the magnitude inside the complex numbers. And you should find that every non-zero integral ideal j contains a non-zero element alpha, such that the norm of alpha over the norm of j is at most 2 root 7 over pi. Now, given that 2 root 7 over pi is strictly less than 2, you can conclude immediately that this ring is a unique factorization domain. In both of these cases, we've used the fact that our additive lattice can be nicely embedded into the complex plane. But we've seen an example before of where this isn't true. If you try and embed z adjoin root 2 into the complex plane, well, it ends up collapsing onto the real line, and the norm function, which sends a plus b root 2 to a squared minus 2b squared, can't be turned into the square of a magnitude function by some clever stretching, because it can take negative values. Next video, we'll think about ways of embedding rings like this into geometric spaces, and we'll see if the geometry of numbers can tell us something there. Section 4. Sums of squares. A while back I claimed, without proof, the following classical result. If p is a prime, and p is 1 mod 4, then p equals a squared plus b squared for some integers a and b. I'm going to prove this geometrically. First of all, a couple of lemmas. I'm going to work modulo any odd prime p for now. The first one is called Fermat's Little Theorem, and it says the following. If n is any integer not divisible by p, then n to the power of p minus 1 is equal to 1 mod p. Now here's a quick proof. Consider the numbers n, 2n, 3n, up to p minus 1n. None of these are 0 mod p. If one of them was, say, kn equals 0 mod p, where k is between 1 and p minus 1, that means that p would have to divide kn, and therefore that p would have to divide either k or n by Euclid's lemma, but it doesn't. Right. So, none of these are 0 mod p, and by a similar argument, they're all different mod p. If, say, jn equals kn mod p, where j and k are between 1 and p minus 1, then j minus k times n is 0 mod p, which, by the same argument, says that j must equal k. So, modulo p, the numbers n, 2n, and so on up to p minus 1n, are just the numbers 1, 2, up to p minus 1, maybe in a different order. That means the product of these numbers, 
is equal to the product of these numbers, mod p. In other words, n to the p minus 1 times p minus 1 factorial equals p minus 1 factorial, mod p. But now we can just cancel a factor of p minus 1 factorial from both sides, and we get our result. Okay, that proves Fermat's little theorem. So, if n to the p minus 1 is 1 mod p, then its square root, n to the p minus 1 over 2, must be either plus or minus 1 mod p. Which is it? Well, that question is answered by Euler's criterion. n to the p minus 1 over 2 is 1 if n is a square mod p, that is, if there exists some L such that n is L squared mod p, and it's minus 1 otherwise. Okay, here's a proof. Let's do the easy part first. If n is L squared mod p, then n to the p minus 1 over 2 is L squared to the p minus 1 over 2, which is just L to the p minus 1, which is just 1 mod p by Fermat's little theorem. Okay, now what if n isn't a square? Well, we know that all the numbers 1, 2, 3 up to p minus 1 satisfy the equation n to the p minus 1 subtract 1 equals 0 mod p. And this polynomial has p minus 1 roots. But this polynomial on the left hand side is also a difference of two squares. So we can factorize it as n to the p minus 1 over 2 minus 1 times n to the p minus 1 over 2 plus 1 equals 0 mod p. So this polynomial must have p minus 1 over 2 roots, and this polynomial must have p minus 1 over 2 roots. We've just shown that the squares satisfy the first polynomial, so if there are p minus 1 over 2 of them, then all the non-squares must satisfy the second polynomial. So, out of the numbers 1, 2, and so on up to p minus 1, how many are squares? Well, just like over the real numbers, Every non-zero square has exactly two square roots. If x squared equals, say, s mod p, then p minus x squared equals s mod p too. So squaring is a two-to-one operation. There are p minus one numbers on the left, so there must be p minus one over two squares here on the right. They must all be roots of the first polynomial, which can only have p minus 1 over 2 roots, and so all the non-squares are forced to be roots of the second polynomial. That's the other half, and that finishes our proof. Okay, finally, let's apply this lemma with n equals minus 1, and p is 1 mod 4. Let's say p is 4 times k plus 1. We know that n to the p minus 1 over 2 is either plus or minus 1. Which is it? Well, p minus 1 over 2 is 2 times k, which is even, and minus 1 to an even power is 1. So, our lemma tells us that there exists some L such that L squared is minus 1 mod p. In other words, p divides L squared plus 1. Keep this in mind. Let's go back to what we wanted to prove at the start of this section. If p is a prime, 1 mod 4, then p equals a squared plus b squared for some integers a and b. Okay, let l be that number we just found, such that p divides l squared plus 1, and now we can set up the lattice that's going to solve this for us. Draw the lattice in r squared, generated by the vectors u equals 0 comma p, and v equals 1 comma l. The fundamental cell here has area p. So any convex symmetric bubble around the origin with area bigger than 4 times p will contain a lattice point. Let's pick the open disk d of radius the square root of 2p. The area here is 2 pi times p, which is greater than 4p, so d does contain a point on the lattice. So our original diagram should probably have looked like this, as it contains a point on the lattice. Anyway, let's call this point we found du plus ev, which is e, dp plus el, 
in our coordinates on our squared. Now, here's where the careful choice of the lattice comes in. We'll calculate the square of the distance of this point from the origin. It must be less than 2p, because the point is inside the disk. On the other hand, we can work it out directly. Mod du plus ev squared is e squared plus dp squared plus 2depl plus el squared. Okay, now this term is divisible by p, and this term is divisible by p, and what we have left is e squared times 1 plus l squared, which is also divisible by p, because of how we chose l. So, if you square and add the pair of numbers e and dp plus el, you get something divisible by p, but not 0, and less than 2p. So it must be p. So these are our numbers a and b, and that's the end of our proof.